Hi there, this is Dr. Evan Osar with Fitness Education Seminars. Welcome to this edition of Fitness Insider, where we're going to take a look at a three-part series on corrective exercise strategies. In part one, we're going to take a look at the shoulder. Part two, we're going to look at the hip. And in part three, we're going to look at corrective exercise strategies for cueing improved posture and sort of put together both the shoulder and the hip. So let's get started. Shoulder pain and shoulder dysfunction are two of the most common reasons people will visit a medical doctor and one of the most common reasons people will see me as a chiropractic physician. In fact, it's only second to low back pain and probably only because people think of low back pain, they go, they go to their chiropractic physician and when they think about neck and shoulder pain, they may, think, they may go to their physical therapist and or medical doctor before they think about a chiropractor. So again, it's one of the most common things we'll see in our clients as fitness professionals when they come to see, when they come to see us looking to get in shape but they actually, when we start to do evaluations, they actually have pretty poor function of both the shoulder complex as well as their neck and upper back. And we'll talk a little bit about both these areas and how they relate, relate to this shoulder later on in this presentation. So one of the most common shoulder problems we're going to see in our clients? Well, one of the mo more common or most common issues we'll see is we'll see shoulder impingement. Again, impingement of the rotator cuff and or bicipital tendon and or subacromial bursa. So again, we get structures impinged underneath the or between the scapula and the humerus. We will also see bicipital tendinosis type problems where the biceps tendon gets irritated be because of poor mechanics or an optimal mechanics. And we'll also see neck pain as a direct, direct result of what happens through the scapular mechanics. And all these things can be related to, you guess it, scapulothoracic instability. When we have lack of coactivation of scapular stabilizers, precisely or more specifically, the muscles that are responsible for posterior tilting the scapula as well as upwardly rotating the scapula, we're going to get a lot of our chronic shoulder and neck problems. And again, they'll manifest as rotator cuff problems, they'll manifest as neck problems, but really what they start out as is scapulothoracic instability problems, as you can see in this client here, who's got what we call and consider the downward rotation syndrome, where the inferior angle of the scapula comes more towards the midline of the spine versus the superior angle. And again, the arrow's pointing right to the inferior angle, sort of winging off the thoracic cage. And this is also a problem of doing too much scapular retraction exercises, too many Y's, T's, W's, pulling your shoulder blades down and back, that pull those shoulder blades down and back into a poor position, especially in the presence of scapular thoracic instability, which most of our clients have. So again, cueing this down and back posture actually feeds right into the problem they have. So how are we going to improve this function? Again, if we look at this client here, we see the downward rotation syndrome, and you see the inferior angle of the scapula is more medial towards the spine than the superior angle and we get the downward rotation and if you can even see her upper trap on her right side this patient's right side is over lengthened and yes she gets trigger points and pain in her upper lateral border of her scapula or upper medial border of her scapula right where my arrow is pointing right here and again that is levator scapula trigger points not upper trap if she stretches her upper trap, she'll create more dysfunction. The upper trap is inhibited and over lengthened. The serratus is inhibited and over lengthened. And even the posterior and lower fibers of the trapezius are inhibited and over lengthened and not controlling the scapular position. Again, this puts a lot of stress on both the rotator cuff as well as the neck stabilizers and the upper thoracic spine. So, what's our corrective exercise strategy checklist? Well, number one, we want to improve activation of the upward rotators and the posterior tilters of the scapula. Again, the upward rotators and posterior tilters are the upper trap, the lower trap, and the serratus anterior. The force couple of the upper trap, lower trap, and serratus anterior. We want to teach stability during overhead motion. In fact, what we want to do is teach a client how to activate those upward rotators and posterior tilters, and then teach them how to dissociate the glenohumeral joint from the scapula as they perform overhead motion because again if we think back to the image earlier and I'll flip back here when we look at this client here it's really as he comes into the eccentric portion of an overhead raise as he's bringing, bringing his arms back down from an overhead position he loses control and that's what we want to improve 
as they dissociate and bring their arm back down from overhead position, that he's not losing scapulothoracic stability. Second, or third, we want to integrate this function into higher level patterns. So once we improve activation and we teach him how to dissociate the glenohumeral joint, now we're going to teach him how to integrate these functions into functional movement pat patterns of pushing and pulling. So improving activation of the upward rotators and posterior tilters. One of my favorite exercises I'll use with clients, once I've taught them how to activate their core and breathe, is I'll have them push back and do isometric contractions into an object like the ball. You see the image of me here in this slide? And what I'm doing is I'm pushing back into the ball, and again, that's my range of motion. If I try to go down to the floor, I'll lose co connection on my thoracopelvic canister. So as I breathe out, as this arrow is referring to, this horizontal arrow here is referring to, I want to keep the rib cage down and connected to the pelvis. I'm not trying to flatten my low back, I'm just trying to keep my thoracopelvic canister connected. I push back into the ball in sort of a semicircular sort of pattern. And then I want this scapula to come down and around the rib cage. So again, picture where the arrow, the lower arrow is going, down here, as the scapula comes down and around the thorax to approximate mid axilla level. That's where the scapula is stabilized for overhead motion. And again, I want to keep my neck and thorax stable. I do not want to press my neck and or back, upper back into the floor, and I don't want to hyperextend those areas either. They stay neutral. I push back into the ball and bring that scapula down and around the thorax while maintaining that caudal or, in, or inferior position of my ribcage. I'm going to usually, usually do about five reps, five second holds, and then release. And I may do this two or three times a day for clients that have scapular instability problems where I'm trying to restore that upward rotation and posterior tilt stabilization. Next, we have to improve this function and dissociate the glenohumeral joint in overhead motion. So again, in the image to the left, you can see I'm trying to still achieve that down and around position of scapula on the thorax as my arms go up overhead, pressing into the foam roll. This activates the serratus in its protraction roll, but I'm still getting that down and around effect of the scapula coming around the rib cage. Again, a com combination and coactivation of the serratus anterior, upper and lower trapezius, and even now I'm starting to bring some lats in to maintain the inferior position, but still getting the upper rotation of the scapula. The foam roll is a great way to facilitate this upper rotation and give you give the client just a little bit of kinesthetic feedback of how to think about up and around the thorax versus just down and back and or just straight forward. In the overhead wall slide, this is a more challenging position because now I'm going to stabilize my neck and thorax against the wall. I'm going to slide my arm up the wall and I want to make sure my elbow faces straight out towards us as a viewer, I want to make sure that this elbow faces out towards us as my arm slides up the wall, straight up the wall. I do not want to see the elbow deviate to the side, meaning I've lost the ability to activate the serratus and bring that scapula down and around the thorax as my arm goes up overhead. And then I want to bring the arm back down without losing the scapular stability or changing the alignment of my spine. So again, my arm slides up the wall, slides back down, Again, for 10 to 15 repetitions, or as much as I can control, and the motion is stopped when I can no longer maintain alignment of my spine and or my arm position. Last, last or part three is integration. Now that we've taught the client how to stabilize, get that upward rotation and posterior tilt, we've taught them how to dissociate their glenohumeral joint, now start to put, put it together in functional patterns. So again, a one-arm stability press where I'm using my left arm in this image to stabilize my thorax and the right arm is pressing. I want to, again, teach the client how to use those scapular stabilizers and scapular protractors to pull that scapula down and around the rib cage as I'm doing the pressing motion. As I bring it up into a more functional pressing pattern, I can teach the client now how to press out and then control the eccentrically through those scapular stabilizers precisely or more specifically the serratus anterior, upper and lower trapezius, and again, the rhomboids and mid-traps will help stabilize. They're not directly involved with a pushing and or pulling motion. They're working mostly as stabilizers. So we do not want to see a lot of retraction 
through the eccentric phase or pulling down and back during any phase of the motion. Again, recall, the scapula must come around the rib cage, stabilize mid axilla as the arm is pressed forward and or overhead. So let's recap. First, we want to identify the most common cause of scapular instability, and that's the downward, downward rotation syndrome. And we want to improve and isolate the upward rotation function as well as the posterior tilting function of the scapular stabilizers. And again, this is mostly the upper and lower trapezius and the serratus anterior. And then we want to integrate these patterns into our functional movement patterns of pushing and pulling patterns as well as overhead and horizontal type patterns. This is Dr. Evan Osar with Fitness Education Seminars and Fitness Insider. I hope this webinar series served you. Stay tuned for part two where we'll take a similar look at the hip complex and how to improve hip function in our clients. And then part three, we'll talk, take a look at how to cue improved postural responses. Again, it's Dr. Evan Osar. Have a great day. We'll catch you next time.